My name is Adam Coulton. I'm a philosophy tutor at Balliol College and um, my research focuses mainly on the philosophy of physics, um, especially conceptual issues in quantum theory. And I organise the teaching for students doing what you might call the science and philosophy joint schools. So that's maths and philosophy, computer science and philosophy and physics and philosophy. That's a really great question. Um, I think a lot of people come to philosophy with a sort of uh, bewilderment because a lot of them haven't done philosophy at school, uh, not even at A-level. And of course, we don't require uh, any students to have, any applicants to have done uh, philosophy at A-level. Um, but I think in some ways, philosophy is very similar to um, the other science subjects that are often connected to philosophy in the joint degrees. One common theme I think that they all have is uh, giving arguments, going from A to B. And of course, philosophy is very different from physics in that it's not subject to empirical control, at least not in the direct way uh, that physical theories are. And that means that certain aspects of giving an argument become more important. So it's important to be extremely rigorous and to engage in uh, conceptual analysis. I think it's also different in a way from mathematics in that there's a focus on justifying assumptions. You know, a lot of mathematics is deriving uh, results from axioms and not a lot of attention is paid to the axioms themselves. In philosophy, you, you pay attention as it were, both to the inference and to the, and to the axioms. The sort of um, skills that are required to do philosophy well are exactly the same sort of skills that are required to do mathematics or physics well. Enthusiasm um, and curiosity, absolutely important. Um, but in addition to that, um, one of the things that I really look for, and I hope my students develop um, in tutorials with me, is the ability to critically appraise and develop arguments. So critically appraise arguments that they find in the literature and to develop arguments of their own. And some of the things that I look for in an applicant and I sort of try and encourage my, my students to develop is that you know, they might find a very good argument uh, for a particular conclusion and they might be resistant to that conclusion, right? They have a good argument for X and they think, well, I think X is false. And, um, and you know, some people in response to that will just give an argument against X. So you've got two opposing arguments. I think what I, uh, what I look for and what I think is important is that they're able to diagnose, as it were, what, what went wrong with the first argument. So it's not enough just to have an argument for something and an argument against something. There's too many arguments in the world. What I want is uh, the ability to sort of sieve through uh, and to assess the quality of these arguments to get to uh, a reasoned conclusion. Another thing that I look for is a student who, if you like, doesn't look to me for the answer as much as they might come to the right answer. I'd much rather that they tell me what the answer is and convince me that that's the answer. That's what I'm really looking for. Well, the tutorials by and large are focused around an essay. Um, so we will meet maybe uh, once a week or once every fortnight. And in preparation for the tutorial, they'll write an essay of say about 1500 to 2000 words, which is a response to a question that I set them. And that question, by and large, will be quite open-ended. So examples would be, does time pass? Um, or does the empirical success of a scientific theory give good reason for believing that that theory is true? Something like that. Um, and I will set them somewhere between four and eight pieces of reading and they'll go away for a week or two weeks um, and I expect them to do the reading, digest the material and then come up with a, a, a coherent, sustained argument for a well-defined conclusion to that question. The setup would be 
that it's me and one or two other students. And the, the tutorial is sort of focused around the essay uh, or the essays that they will have prepared. For slightly more technical topics, such as the philosophy of special relativity or the philosophy of quantum mechanics, these are sort of topics that are closely connected to material that the students will have studied on the physics side. Um, I tend to have slightly larger groups, maybe three or four, and instead of meeting for an hour, we'll meet for two hours. Um, but tutorials are very different from lectures in the sense that the structure is very organic. So sometimes a tutorial might take the form of simply going through the essay uh, that the student has written, asking them to expand on some points or to defend some points, to hone the argument and so on. Uh, sometimes there'll be less attention to the essay and we'll sort of go into a foundational discussion of the surrounding topics, maybe clearing up um, some muddle or uh, helping to clarify some ideas, develop, develop some concepts and arguments and so on. Um, it's a great thing about the tutorial, actually, that there is that complete freedom to sort of go where it seems most appropriate at the time. Essentially, I am discussing topics that I am very passionate about with the most talented and intelligent people of that age who are also passionate about that subject and who wouldn't want to do that for a living. They are um, approaching a topic that I've thought about a lot from a completely different angle most of the time. And that sort of clashing of different angles, I think, can produce uh, very exciting new ideas. And I think it comes as a bit of a surprise to the students to learn that maybe I've not thought about the topic that I've been thinking about for you know, 10 years or 20 years, that what they've said has made me think about it in a new way, but it happens all the time. Well, the best thing, of course, is, is um, that the students are incredibly talented. Um, and what I really like is that the way that the teaching is organized in the tutorials, it's really between me and the students. So there's not, as it were, a sort of faceless body that's sort of organizing things for, for the both of us. And there's a lot of flexibility that comes with that. And I think that in that flexibility, um, good things can happen. The first thing they should do is seek out some philosophy and read it as soon as possible. Um, that can be a variety of things. So um, maybe getting hold of a classic piece of philosophy, um, for example, George Berkeley's um, Principles of Human Knowledge. That was one of the first philosophy books that I ever read and sort of gave me my passion for it. Um, or to seek out a growing number of very reliable secondary literature um, authors like um, Daniel Dennett or, or Simon Blackburn have written very nice introduction to philosophy books, which I think give a nice overview of the topics. And um, well, there's this wonderful thing now um, called the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which is a resource that's in fact used by academic philosophers, um, which gives a very um, complete overview of a number of different topics. And it's quite nice to sort of dip into that. So I think there's a sort of wealth of resources now um, available to applicants, either from their library or from the internet. And I would just advise them to get stuck in.